Jeremy killed five members of his adopted family. He killed his father, Ralph Bamber, his mother, June Bamber, sister, Sheila Caffel, and her six-year-old twin sons, Nicholas and Daniel. This is a story of overbearing parents and overly religious parents. So I'll give you out the facts of this story, then I'll give you my own personal opinion. If you do end up liking this video, and you do like true crime stories and interrogation analysis in general, please subscribe. And if you would like to support the channel, donation links are in the description. Now this took place in Essex in the United Kingdom. In 1986, 24-year-old Jeremy Bamber was jailed for life for killing five members of his adopted family at their farmhouse in Essex. He was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years for the murders of his step-parents, sister and her two six-year-old sons, Nicholas and Daniel. Sentencing Bamber to five life prison terms, the judge, Mr. Justice Drake, said he was warped and evil beyond belief. The controversial crime was hampered by police setbacks and Bamber remained a free man on bail living off his dead parents while investigations continued. For a long time, he protested his innocence and as recently as 2001, his case was taken back to the Court of Appeal by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. The White House farm murders read like something out of a crime novel. It had all the classic ingredients of a whodunit tethered with a vicious ferocity and cruelty that contrasts with its idyllic setting. The crime involved brutal murders in the English countryside on a summer's evening with a cast of characters straight out of a true crime story. The victims were two overbearing religious parents, a mentally unstable daughter, a scheming envious son and a jilted girlfriend. Bamba did not have a particularly audacious start in life. He was the illegitimate son of a vicar's daughter and a married army sergeant. At six weeks old, he was adopted by wealthy Neville Bamber, a former RAF pilot, and his wife June, who farmed near the Essex village of Tolleson Darcy. A few years later, the Bambers adopted another child, Sheila Caffold, who they nicknamed Bambi. Materialistically, both the children wanted for nothing and were given a private education, but they also had to endure strict discipline imposed by their devoutly Christian parents. Bamba had no interest in his father's business, hated the farm and the farming world, and instead drifted through a series of jobs. He was, however, extremely flamboyant and used his affluent background as a means to impress women with a pseudo playboy image he honed to perfection. As an adult, Sheila was attractive enough to start a promising career as a model and her parents paid for a flat in London where she hoped to become a success. Sheila married and had two twin boys, but when the marriage broke down, she became depressed and began to suffer from illness developing into schizophrenia. One psychiatric report mentions that at times she believed her children were from the devil. Because of her problems, Sheila and the twins moved back to the farmhouse with her parents. By this time, Bamber lived with his student teacher girlfriend, Julie Mugford. They shared a rent-free cottage provided by his parents at Goldhanger, a few miles from the main farmhouse. Neville offered Bamber a job on the farm, paying him £170 a week. It certainly wasn't the glamorous position that the young man was desperate for and even his request to run the caravan site owned by the family were dismissed as Neville believed his son had no business sense. Bamba hated the farm but his father's will cut him off unless he stayed a farmer. He wanted the life of a playboy and was determined to live it at any cost. He also despised his stepmother June for preaching religion at him and he had never forgiven both parents for sending him away to public school. So on the August the 7th 1985 at 3.26 a.m. 
Bamba rang the police to report that his father had just phoned frantically to say Sheila was going berserk with a semi-automatic rifle. When the police broke into the farmhouse, they found several bodies and a scene of near carnage. Neville's corpse, bludgeoned and shot, lay downstairs in a pool of blood. It appeared that he had been shot upstairs but had been beaten as he struggled to the kitchen to summon help. June's bullet-ridden body was in a bedroom and Sheila's twins had each been shot several times in the head while in their sleep, one of them still sucking his thumb. Sheila was also in a bedroom, had been shot in the throat and was clutching a 22 rifle and a Bible. Sheila had a long documented history of illness and it seemed clear to the police that she had shot her parents, children and then finally herself. When Bamba was interviewed at the scene of the crime, he impaired, genuinely distressed and was comforted by an officer and given tea and whiskey. So convinced were the police by Bamba's insistence that his sister perpetrated the dreadful act that they were even agreed to burn carpets and bedding in the house at Bamba's request. Soon the press were reporting the sensational story. Bambi had always wanted fame as a model and ironically she had now won it, briefly, on the front pages of the tabloids as an alleged mass murderer. The police thought that they were dealing with four murders and one suicide. They had been aware of Sheila's mental health problems and when Bamba had made out that his disturbed sister had gone crazy, there seemed no reason to question his story. However, the young man's cavalier behaviour soon began to arouse suspicion. At the funeral nine days later, Bamba let his vanity betray him by admitting that his only worry was that the cameras should catch his best profile. He put on a tearful performance at the graveside, but afterwards he went out for a meal with friends to celebrate, not thinking twice about how this would appear. It was even noted that on the day of the killings, the police had passed Bamba driving to the scene at a casual 30 miles per hour hardly the actions of a distressed son concerned about his family. Finally, when Bamba told his girlfriend, Julie Mugford, that he had hired a hitman for £2,000, she reported this comment to the police. Despite this throwaway comment, the evidence against Bamba remained circumstantial. Although Bamba's fingerprints had been found on the murder weapon, alongside those of Sheila, there was no other forensic evidence to link him to the killings. In large, part due to the fact that police had allowed the crime scene to be cleared. In the meantime, Bamba enjoyed a life of luxury, spending his parents' money and even going on holiday to Amsterdam. Although his behaviour was now being closely watched, Bamba appeared unaffected and detached from the traumatic events. His sister's modelling photos were all he wanted as a keepsake so he could offer them for sale. Fleet Street turned him down but the likes of the sun publicly demonstrated its disdain by brandishing front page headlines with Bambi brother in photo scandal. Despite the lack of evidence against him, the investigation unveiled a quandary with regard to the murder weapon. Without a silencer, the 25 shots that were fired would have made too much noise and would have alerted the victims to the danger. Yet if a silencer was attached to the weapon, it would have been too long for Sheila to have shot herself. This startling realisation seemed to rule out the theory that Sheila had taken her own life and therefore the possibility that she had been responsible for the other murders. Whoever committed the crime would have had to take the silencer off before they left the house after carrying out the killings. It was David Boatflower, Bamba's cousin, who found the silencer in a cupboard at the farm still with traces of Sheila's blood on it, alongside a single grey hair. However, before forensics could study the hair, it had been lost. What was now certain was that Sheila had not committed suicide, but had been murdered. This confirmation meant that Bamba's call to the police, saying that she was running amok, was a lie. On September 29, 1985, Bamba was arrested and charged with murder. The trial commenced at Chelmsford Crown Court on October 14, 1986. Bamba's girlfriend, Julie Mugford, 
was the star witness. She alleged that Bamba had made murderous threats against his father. She told the court that Bamba had made the reference that his old father, mad mother and sister had nothing to live for. It was then that he spoke of arson and later a desire to hire a hitman. There were two explanations for the killings. The first was the prosecution case that Bamba entered the Essex farmhouse owned by his mother and father at night and shot the five members of his family with a legally held rifle. Sheila's blood was in the silencer of the murder weapon proving that she could not have shot herself then put it in a cupboard downstairs. The second explanation put forward by the defence was that Sheila who had a history of psychiatric illness had shot the four members of her family with the rifle and then committed suicide. In the initial stages the police thought it likely that the second explanation was correct. Some officers however thought that some of the findings were inconsistent with this explanation and members of the Bamba's extended family did not believe that it was consistent with their knowledge of Sheila. Despite mounting evidence Bamba remained confident that he would leave court a free man however the jury at Chelmsford Crown Court delivered a guilty verdict by 10 to 2. Bamba was handed five life sentences with a recommendation that he stay in prison for at least 25 years without parole. The judge said, I find it difficult to foresee whether it will ever be safe to release someone who can shoot two little boys as they lie asleep in their beds. He also noted the problems that had taken place during the initial inquiries and throughout the main police investigations. The first major error in this case was the police allowing the house to be cleared shortly after the killings. The house itself had been cleaned and the carpets and bedclothes burned on instruction of Bamba. Bamba's fingerprints were eventually discovered on the Bible and gun left on Sheila's body but were missing during the initial inquiries. It was also revealed that while Bamba had said that he received a panic-stricken phone call from his father, Neville had actually been shot in the throat in the upstairs of the house and couldn't have made such a call. The catalogue of blunders led the trial judge Mr Justice Drake to comment the perfunctory examination is only explicable because the police thought there was nothing to solve. Bamba needed to finance his playboy lifestyle. If his plan had succeeded, he would have received his parents leasehold farm, other prime land, the contents of the main house which he had reinsured and half a share in a holiday home caravan site. The total of the estate was estimated at £436,000. Bamba was told by his trial judge that he was warped and evil and added that he found it difficult to imagine anyone agreeing to release Bamba from jail in the future. He has been told by each Home Secretary since his conviction that he will never gain his freedom through parole although Bamba has always pleaded his innocence and has seen two appeals against his convictions rejected. In July 2001, a team of police officers were given four months to complete fresh inquiries into the case. It was referred back to the Court of Appeal by the Criminal Cases Review Commission which investigates possible miscarriages of justice. In 2002, Bamba angered his relatives when he offered £1 million as a reward for any information that would help quash his conviction. In December 2002, he lost his appeal against his conviction and also lost the High Court case regarding a claim of £1.27 million from his grandmother's will that he thought he was entitled to. In 2004, Bamba was attacked by a fellow prisoner with a knife while talking on the phone and needed 20 stitches. So now we come to my thoughts in conclusion and I think it was the case that Jeremy was selfish and he only ever thought of himself. He had a huge ego and was spoiled. Now I know his parents were religious and they were overbearing it seems but not completely. I don't think they were as overbearing as what reports have suggested. For example, his sister wanted to be a model. Religious parents would have generally objected toward it. I know, I know, maybe not all parents, but you understand what I'm trying to say. Them being overbearing, I can understand. Him getting annoyed, I get it. They probably wanted him to take over the farm, as mentioned, and he was like, no, I want to go out and I want to have fun. And to be honest, at the age of 24, when he's got all the money in the world, all right, and seems like a decent looking lad, thinks highly of himself, the last thing he wants to do is go and take over his family's business. 
particularly something like a farm and other estates where it doesn't seem or he didn't see it as something prestigious. Now to conclude on Jeremy's behaviour, I think he just saw his family as a distraction. His sister's mental breakdown after the marriage makes sense. I mean, we all take tragedy differently, but it's clear his sister had some kind of psychotic break when she got divorced, you know, as she become depressed, etc. I think Jeremy wanted the money all for himself, so he would never have to work a day in his life. I don't think he was lazy, right? I don't think he hated work. I just think he thought to himself, well, I've got all the money in the world already, so to speak, right? But I can't do everything with it because my freedom is limited. It's limited because I have people I have to answer to. These were his parents who just so happened to be quite strict. And Jeremy, who only ever cared about himself and only ever thought about himself, just wanted to go out and have fun and show the world how great he was. And all he wanted was just his family to be moved out the way. I mean, the ideal situation for Jeremy is if his father came to him and said, you know what, Jeremy, here's two million pounds. Now get lost and do what you want. His father was never going to do that. But that would have been the ideal scenario for Jeremy. See, the thing for Jeremy was that at the age of 24, he wanted that rich high life. But what Jeremy didn't realize is that there's always a cost that comes with it. It may seem great to be a millionaire, to be young and to do whatever you want. I'm 33 almost. I have a big following on TikTok and this YouTube channel is doing pretty well. It's paying me pretty well. I won't lie to you guys. There are times in the street where people say, hey, you're that TikTok, all right? It's a weird feeling to be known in the public eye, which is what Jeremy wanted. You know, that playboy lifestyle, fame, money, women, cars, you know, every material aspect you can think of. But what Jeremy and other people don't know when they look from the outside in is when you get a little bit of fame and when you start making good money, the problems that come with that cannot be seen. People look at the success of other people and they aspire to be that. But what they don't see is the two, three, four, five years worth of hard work that that person took to get there. Go and have a look at some big YouTube channels. You'll see videos, 100,000, 500,000, 1 million views consistently. But what people won't do is go back to the very beginning where most of their videos were garbage. Specifically, I'm not being rude, but I'm trying to say that big content creators, successful content creators have gone through a lot of trial and error. They've gone through a lot of pain. They've gone through a lot of soul searching to get to where they are. Jeremy was not willing to go through any of that. Jeremy just wanted it all quick and fast and didn't want any questions answered of him. Jeremy was a child. Thank you for watching.